Welcome to another edition of Under the Strap. I'm your host, John Rathouse. And on this episode, I catch up with Diane Knox Bayless. You might recognize the name Knox and say, is she related to Russell Knox on the PGA Tour? And you'd be right. Diane is Russell's older sister, and she's carved out her own space in the golf world and media. We talk extensively about golf betting, including how she handicaps a tournament, and trace her background in media and journey from Scotland to the States. We dish on this week's Scottish Open and next month's Open Championship at St. Andrews. What's it like to grow up with the home of golf in your backyard? And what's her favorite course in the world? It wouldn't be up to date if we didn't talk about the latest in live golf and the PGA Tour response. Diane splits the middle like a true pro, just like her brother does off the tees, but she's more informed than most given her close links. We finish with some rapid fire, including what she thinks haggis tastes like and which baby boy name she would consider out of a handful in the top 100 golfers in the world. Under the Straps' first female guest is a fun interview. Enjoy. This Under the Strap podcast is presented by TheraBody. If your muscles are sore or tight, help them relax with the TheraBody Theragun. The number one massaging tool on the market and incredibly easy to use, the Theragun is designed to help you play longer and get more out of your body. So do what caddies and players on tour do and treat your muscles. Go to therabody.com slash caddy, C-A-D-D-I-E, to get your Theragun today, starting at just $199. Now it's time for another episode of Under the Strap. All right, joined now Under the Strap by Diane Knox. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you for having me. You know I'm a big fan of you guys, and I love your podcast every week, so I'm very honored that you wanted me on as your guest. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, you know, we haven't had many non caddies on and you're our first female guest. So, you know, we're really, we're really happy to have you on and, and you have so many cool things you're involved in right now, just to give like a brief introduction. I mean, you're, you're a host and presenter. You've been in the golf industry for a long time. You're involved with a lot of these, uh, gambling outlets. You've got a secret golf that you do with Steve Elkington, uh, the, the golf betting club, and you're also a golf analyst for PicksWise. And I, was able to dive into a few of the columns you've uh, written for your hometown newspaper, the Inverness Courier, oh. which looks like a really cool project that you get to do too. You kind of get to get whatever's off your chest, you know, out there. And so lots of cool things. You're very busy right now, huh? Yeah, it's good. It's um, I, I like to have my finger in a lot of pies, so to speak, because I think that, well, especially in, in our industry, in, in golf media, there's so much going on right now. I mean, I'm sure we're going to touch on that in a little while, but even the the emergence of betting into the golf space over the last year or so, I mean, it's just blown up and it's opened up a lot more opportunities. So yeah, I mean, my, my background's always been as a host um, in Scotland. I was a radio presenter, we called it, for 12 years. And then when I moved over here, it was a case of, okay, well, I've got this skill set where I've been involved in, in media, in presentation, in content for so long how can I combine that with, you know, obviously golf is in my family again, I'm sure we're going to touch on that, but, um, you know, how can I combine it with that passion and being in Florida and in Jacksonville, it's kind of like the hub of golf with the PGA tour headquarters here. So, um, it's amazing. You know, it's such a friendly space to be in. It's a great industry. I mean, I get to speak to people like you, we, we make so many friends. It's kind of a small community in a lot of ways. And um, it's it's only getting bigger and better. Yeah, no, I've been really uh, grateful to kind of dip my toes into it a little bit more in the last year and a half. Uh, you know, and you, you mentioned uh, your golf background, your golf family. Obviously, you're the brother of uh, Russell Knox, who I know not super well, but been out with him over the years in different groups and practice rounds. Uh, nice fella. So, uh, you know, that's mm-hmm. always cool. To, to know and to, and to track him as well. I, I know this is his birthday week. We're recording this now and he's playing at the travelers, which is the site of one of his great wins. Um, you know, I guess what's that like for you to kind of follow along uh, with his career simultaneously, like why you're kind of doing what you're doing. It's, I think it's, it's twofold. And I always really make a point of saying like, this is Russell's world. So if there was ever a point where I encroached upon it or he wasn't comfortable with it, I would exit because, you know, this is his thing. It's his career. He's obviously had great success and will continue to. So it's, um, I always say, you know, it's his thing <laughs> and, and I like to keep it separate. 
so I can go and support him as his sister. But then, you know, there's been times I've had to interview him for certain things as well, and it's always good fun. But um, it, it's great because I obviously have been involved in his golf career since he turned pro and joined the PGA Tour. So it's really nice to see it from that perspective. And through working in golf, I, I get to understand his world a little bit better as well. So, for example, with all of this live golf stuff that's been going on lately, him and I have had hours of conversations about it, you know, re really digging in. And it's really good that I get to share that part of his career with him. So, but then, you know, I'm, I'm one of his biggest fans too. I love being able to separate work and be able to go out there and follow him and support him just like any other sister would. Can you, can you hit these laser beams on the pin just like your bro? No. I think uh, he got that talent. <laughs> he got that I don't talent. think there was that much to go around, so I'm quite happy for him to have all of that. <laughs> That's funny. Well, one one of the ones things I was looking at was you know your secret golf. You get the podcast. You guys do some betting picks with with Elkington. What's that like working with Steve? He's he's an interesting dude. I've actually been out with Steve over the years. I, I I'll tell you a story. I caddied for Steve Elkington for a half a hole one year in in the Deutsche <laughs> Bank in Boston. <gasps> that is cool. So so he had he had the infamous bullet bob on the bag. I don't know if you've ever heard that name before. Old school gruff caddy. Oh yeah. And he him and Elkington were together for a long time. And they kind of got they kind of got at each other on the on the golf course that day. And on the last hole, Bullet walked off the bag. He left the bag at the back of the green with like a note on the bag or whatever. And just walked away, you know, I was oh like, God. what? And I picked up, I had, I was working um, for John Merrick at the time. And I put, I had John Merrick's bag on my shoulder. Then I picked up Steve's and took it for to the oh cart to get away. That was the one time I put his bag on my shoulder. That's funny. That's very funny. Um, you know, obviously anyone that's been around him has stories and he is the greatest storyteller of all time. He remembers everything. He'll tell me things that happened, you know, 20, 30 years ago in amazing detail. And I'm like, how on earth do you recall? I mean, it's obviously, I think that golfer's brain is kind of wired that way anyway, but he's amazing. He is such an incredible person. And it's great because I started working with Secret Golf. I moved to the US in August 2016 and I started working with Secret Golf in September. So it has only been like a month of being here really. And we just gelled immediately. He was looking for someone to come on Secret Golf, like a, a female kind of co-host, mm -hmm. more well, more of a host role to kind of set him up and and it and kind of guide him through all the projects. And it's it's been great. It's just that I think it wouldn't have worked had we not hit it off so quickly. Mm -hmm. And He's such, I mean, obviously he's had an incredible career and phenomenal talent. He has the silkiest golf swing of all time. I talked about the stories, but then he's such a, an amazing family man with his wife, Lisa, and his kids. And he's, um, he's just been an absolute joy for me to work alongside and to really learn from as well, because he's, uh, he's got a phenomenal brain when it comes to the way that the golf space is developing and, and what he wants to bring to it. Interesting. So, well, you mentioned when you moved over here to the States, I guess, just let's get a little background. I mean, where are you from originally? I know Scotland, but, but what, what town? I was born in Inverness in the Highlands of Scotland. It's the capital of the Highlands. You alluded to, I write for the Inverness Courier, which is my local newspaper. I actually did my work experience there when I was in high school, which is nice to kind of come full circle and I'd be writing a weekly column for them. But I um, grew up in Inverness and I went to university in Glasgow, which is the biggest city mm -hmm. in Scotland and did media and communication there. I finished, went back to Inverness and that's when I started working in radio. I started working on, on the local station there for six years. Then I moved back to Glasgow and started working for the biggest station in Scotland um, for another six years before moving over here. And my brother had moved over to Jacksonville to go to university in 2000 and oh my gosh one maybe mm -hmm. no 2003 and then my parents moved over to Jacksonville in 2005 my dad's from San Diego originally oh. and they always wanted to you know relocate back to the state somewhere and they just loved Jacksonville so they moved here in 05 and then it just got to the point where it was like do I really want to live my life on the other side of the world for my family obviously so much was happening in Russell's career and 
you know, everyone's getting older and I just thought it was, it just all kind of worked out. It was the right time for me to relocate and base myself in Jacksonville and I've never looked back. Well, what are some of the, uh, I, you know, I've been to Ireland. I've, I've never been to Scotland. I'd love to get there no. sometime and get, the open championship is one on my list that I've never caddied in out of the majors. And, and so, you know, you never, never too late. I will see. Um, but what are some of the great golf courses that were like a stone's throw away from Inverness, you know, growing up? My brother played at Nairn Dunbar Golf Club. That was his local club. There's Nairn Golf Club, which is very well known. And then Nairn Golf Club was uh, kind of the, the lesser well-known club that was maybe a little bit cheaper to play and mm -hmm. not so kind of stuffy. And that's the club that Russell gravitated towards and, and he joined there you know as early as he could so those are two really great courses and then there's castle stewart mm. which is they've, they've hosted the scottish open a lot that's the closest course that that anyone would really know i guess mm -hmm. um close to inverness then there's other courses inverness golf club again another really great golf course that's right in the middle of the city so but castle stewart it's um i love that place as well i've been to a few scottish opens there and it's always a brilliant venue um, so then you, growing up, uh, is it just you and, and Russell and would you guys, I mean, playing a lot of golf growing up as a family? Like, what was that like? Do you know, I never played when I was you younger play. ever oh. because well, I mean, that, that was his thing. Uh -huh. Do you know what I mean? Like he was my, he's two years younger than me and you don't want to be doing what your younger brother is doing. <laughs> so my dad played and um, my dad's always worked in business, had his own companies and he was, um, he went to the doctor because he was just feeling terrible and the doctor was like you're really stressed out you need to find a hobby that's going to help relax you so my dad had played we call it american football <laughs> all his life baseball you know growing up in san diego all the the real american sports and he was like i, I can give this a go and play golf and then obviously just became hooked and he really got russell playing when he was just tiny and um yeah, we were always, my mom and I were always there. I mean, there was always events at the golf club. And um, especially once I got my driver's license, Russell would be like, can you drive me to golf? Sure, what's your tea time? 7 a.m. Oh, great. <laughs> so we were always very actively involved in it because it really, especially as he grew older and got better, I think we knew that it was really going to dominate his life. Your dad sounds like a really fascinating dude. He is. He is the best. He, My dad is like, larger than life personality my dad and i are very similar and russell and my mom are very similar but um, yeah my dad is uh, again great storyteller always got a good story <laughs> so so then you get in the broadcasting space i guess who are some of the broadcasters maybe you know when you were growing up or just starting to get into it and, and then maybe now that you kind of look up to and admire I mean, I think when I first got into broadcasting, because I was radio based predominantly in Scotland, it was really, you know, kind of a British radio hosts that I really um, would aspire to be like. And again, it's one of those things where there wasn't too many females. There wasn't too many females that were hosting their own show. The female was kind of given the role of the co-host who's who, who speaks when she's spoken to or, you know, would present the travel bulletins. So, I mean, I, I started off doing that, but then very quickly was like, no, I want to be sitting in the seat. I want to be the host of the yeah. show. So there were a few really prominent female broadcasters in the UK on, on Radio 1 that I grew up listening to. And then um, I really said from day one, no, this is what I want to be doing. I want to be the one in the seat who's pushing the buttons and kind of guiding the conversation. So... I, I had a, a, a great career over there and, and loved it. And it was more, I think now how I look at broadcasters is slightly different. Obviously I pay a lot more attention to golf broadcasters and devote more mm -hmm. time to watching and listening to golf than anything else. But um, I'm actually quite sad that Nick Faldo is leaving CBS when mm -hmm. I saw that news announced this week. I really like him. I think that yeah. over the years, he's really you know established himself as, I think he's got better over the years for sure. But um, yeah, I was kind of sad that he's going to be going. Yeah, it's been a long time. I mean, and, and him and Jim Nance teamed up really well. And he's, you know, all these guys have great insights to offer. They do it their own way. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think he will be missed. It. It's interesting to see uh, Immelman got promoted, I think, to be mm -hmm. kind of the lead guy. Um, so that'll be interesting to see how he kind of develops. And I'm sure yeah. at some point Jim Nance is going to, you know, be replaced. I, 
I have been impressed. I haven't been able to watch a ton, but I have been impressed with obviously Colt and then Amanda for the CBS broadcast have been doing fantastic. Just kind of reshaping that a little bit. Yeah, I love um I mean Colt Nost was part of the Secret Golf team when he was playing um and has a very good relationship with Elk. So I'd interviewed Colt so many times and he had talked even when he was still playing about how he did want to branch into broadcasting and was doing a little bit here and there. And then I remember I interviewed him just when he played his final event on the tour for the it was the waste management Phoenix Open for his big hometown event. What a way and, to go out, yeah. I know, right? I think he had a good time that weekend. But um, yeah, he had said then that he had a few good opportunities and he came out there and was amazing. A real fan favorite, not only a fan favorite, but a player favorite too. And I think, you know, you know it because you've been involved in, in the circuit, in the inner circle for so long that you're just going to get a different side of the players when they know you and they trust you and right. they understand that you know what it's like to be in their shoes. And I think Colt's just... He is the best part of the broadcast every week. And I'm a huge fan of Amanda Valionis. Um, mm. I kind of know Amanda just really through social media. And again, being in this small little media circle in golf. But yeah. I love that they've been giving her a more of a starring role. And it's not just the case of like, oh, hey, you know, she's going to give some information about someone that's in contention and then do the winner's interview. When they have her and Colt sitting out on uh, par threes mm -hmm. at the weekend of a tournament, I think it's just brilliant. And she's a, she's a boss. She can handle herself. And <laughs> I always think she's a, she's so knowledgeable. She You can tell she goes above and beyond to really research and 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 she knows her stuff. So I, I yeah. think this growing role, this developing role that she has and alongside Colt, I love and I want more of that. Yeah, for sure. Me too. Uh, what you mentioned interviewing Colt, I guess, what are some of your other favorite people that you've interviewed, you know, in the last, you know, five or seven years in the, in the golf world? Well, we have, um, there's a lot of the golfers that we work with at Secret Golf. Um, we call them our contributors and we've built up really good relationships with them over the years. So um, like Mark Leishman, Ryan Palmer, Jason Kokrak, obviously it's been great to see Kokrak you know go on an absolute tear after getting mm -hmm. his debut win so that's been really fascinating um andrew landry brian Harmon, jt poston who's been playing great at the travelers so i've spent a lot of time with those guys and interviewing those guys and again it's nice to have that kind of trusting relationship with them that i think they know that if we want them to do something for us it's going to be pretty easy we're not going to trip them up with anything and um hopefully there's that that good level of trust there so yeah, they're always great. And I mean, gosh, I'm trying to think who else I've interviewed over the years because there's been a lot. But it's um, that's one of the best parts of the job because obviously I have such an interest in golf. And I said earlier that I think I understand it a little bit better from talking to Elk and talking to Russell so much and interviewing these players so often that it's um, it's always just fascinating to pick their brains. And I think the psychology aspect of golf, I love so much and I'm so fascinated in. And, and the more you talk to these guys, the more you really see into that. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned uh, the, the we've talked a little bit about the gambling. I'm, I'm fascinated by, you know, you're involved in, you know, these, all these ventures and, and I went on and looked and uh, you're, you're on a little bit of a heater right now. We'll see how the travelers, turns out but uh you know you you were on rory in canada you were on fitzy at the u.s open which I, I was happy to be in that same space too in fact had the chance yes. to talk to billy foster the week before they went and won so that was really cool i guess I, I would think growing up in scotland you're kind of exposed to the gambling culture a little bit younger uh, uh so is that part of was that already on your radar and then kind of how did you kind of bridge over into that um you know, once you got stateside. It's funny because even my husband, I'll try and explain to him what the gambling culture is like in Scotland. And he just can't figure it out. He can't fathom that you have like these bookies. Mm -hmm. where, and on a lot of street, I mean, I lived in Glasgow in Scotland, which is a really working class city. And, and on a lot of streets, every fifth shop will be a bookies and people are in there all day watching TV screens and gambling and yeah. Um, obviously, we have horse racing over there and a, a lot of horse tracks, um, especially in Glasgow. But when I said earlier that my dad had business in Scotland, one of his companies was he would rent out um, like fruit machines to pubs and hotels. So I guess in that sense, the gambling side's always been a little bit in my family. Um, but it's funny because my dad would always say, 
you know, never gamble. Like <laughs> we're taking the money of the people that, that gamble and want to throw it away. But when it really started to develop and um, and become a lot more popular in golf, and you could really see that it was a, a market that was just about to explode, I think that it was kind of a, a no brainer that it's something that I really had to get into. And and obviously, I was kind of making picks every week without it being linked to gambling. Mm -hmm. So to do the two, I was like, well, great, you know, I'm all in on this, but I really have to make sure I put the work in because at the end of the day, if you're recommending names to people and they're going to part with their hard earned cash, right. you have to make sure that you're doing your sure. due, dil due diligence and really putting in the, the research time. So I love it. I am. Um, I mean, I, I definitely am a heart picker sometimes, like I get very emotionally involved, <laughs> but I mean, and Matt Fitzpatrick, I think was a little bit of that, but you know, obviously it, it paid off for both of us. So that was good. But I mean, you made a great case for it and there was, it was to me, you know, it was amazing in the sense that he had so many things going for him that it seemed too good to be true. Like yeah. there's no way that this is going to happen. And for him to actually, you know, pull it off, I, I was seriously impressed by that achievement. I mean, obviously the course is a great fit for him, but just to to, to capitalize on the opportunity, I, I thought that was really impressive. Yeah, well, I always say I have to have at least three solid arguments as to why I'm going to pick someone. And when I started looking at Fitzpatrick for the US Open, I was like, oh my gosh, I have like 10 solid well, arguments. Yeah. <laughs> why? So again, a no brainer, but I always relate it back to the kind of like the feel good side of it. And when I found out that he was staying with the same family that he'd stayed with in 2013 when he won the US Amateur there, I'm like, oh my gosh, She's sleeping in the same bedroom. Like mm -hmm. you, we all know that golfers are absolute OCD creatures of habit. So right. I thought, you know, how great for him. He's going to feel so comfortable, not only on the course, but in the bed that he's sleeping in <laughs> at right. night too. So <laughs> it was, um, yeah, that was amazing for him. So good to see. Very, very worthy winner. Long time coming. And you mentioned a little bit of your strategy there. I guess peel back the curtain a little bit more. Like what is your, you know, how do you go about handicapping a tournament? Just maybe the beginning of the week when you're saying I'm going to throw out these six players to win what's your process I can't give away all my secrets <laughs> well yeah don't give away all your secrets but just well Joel Damon I just checked actually and of all my picks this week I think Joel Damon's probably the one that's performing best right now but I as I said I always want to have at least three solid arguments as to why I should pick someone um I'll look at stats for one of them I mean I spend a lot mm -hmm. of time on a Monday morning going through stats and, you know, I'll obviously look at the course, see what the requirements are going to be to do well on that course, and then link that in with the stats. So that takes up a lot of time. And um, then form, current form and momentum. And you can really identify trends. I mean, Fitzpatrick was a perfect example in that he had been playing so well. He'd been really trending towards greatness. Um, you know, Cameron Young, I'm like, he's another one that it's got to be coming at some point yeah. soon for him. Yeah. Um, and then I'll look at the the off the course stuff as well, you know. So like Fitzpatrick saying, um, in the house with the same family. There's all you can always find some really cool little tidbits, you know, maybe from tournament history or um, just some other stuff that they've got going on. I'm always big on guys when they've just had a baby or they just got engaged. <laughs> you know, you've got it all the time. But I'm like, hey, listen, you have to have a happy off course life. To be able to play great golf, so or or if they have a different caddy for the week, <laughs> yeah. See, but stuff like that is always good to know, um, and that's why you really have to to dive in. Twitter and Instagram are so good for that, and it yeah. you know players or caddies could put up some little throwaway thing that you're like, oh my gosh, that's huge this week. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you, that's why. I mean, when it comes to doing the research, you really have to put in your time and effort to explore so many different places to get your information yeah my mondays used to be filled with traveling to and from the next tournament or walking nine or 18 holes and now at noon i'm on fantasynational.com <laughs> pouring over stats it's a little bit different um so this is going to be dropping next week this week huge week in golf i mean you got the john deere classic you've got live event number two on their schedule and then also the scottish open which is being played mm -hmm. at the renaissance which um you know, looks like a really cool club. I looked at it online. I don't know. Are you familiar with that 
uh, that venue at all. It's a Tom Doak design opened in 2013. I mean, very rare that you can build a modern Lynx land, you know, these days. Yeah, and the, the I mean, I've been there a lot. The Scottish Open's been held at Gullin Golf Club quite a lot, and I've been there, and uh, the Renaissance is not too far. Actually, Russell would usually stay at the Renaissance when he was playing at Gullin in the Scottish Open. So it's um, it's an amazing place, and it's really... I don't want to say Americanized, but that's a group of American investors that went over and built the club. And it's funny because years ago, I remember I was sitting on a plane and I'll talk to anyone. And I was flying, I think I was flying from Jacksonville back to Scotland. And this was before I moved. I think I'd just been over here on, on vacation. And I was sat next to one of the investors from Renaissance and they were just really getting going with the bill. I think they were about to open. And he was telling me all about it. So it's been a fascinating story. And I've watched the Scottish Open there the last couple of years. And it looks amazing. So I'm really looking forward to seeing it this year, especially this year with the Scottish Open being, you know, an elevated event. It's an actual PGA Tour event now in conjunction with the DP World Tour. And it's always a great warm up for guys that are going to play in the Open at, well, at St. Andrews um, next month. So it's I, I love it. Is Russell going to play in the Scottish? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He is. Yep, yep. It's uh, he obviously, you know, it's the one that he wants to win. It's his home open, so he's flying over. He's not playing the John Deere next week, and then he's flying over at the weekend. A quick break here at the turn to tell you more about the Therabody Theragun. I got mine last summer. It's part of my daily routine, and my body has never felt better. I use it before and after caddying, playing golf, working out, or even relief from being hunched over chasing our one-year-old. It's so easy to use that I like to use mine while I'm watching TV. And like a lot of you, I'm traveling again soon, so I've got the Theragun Mini ready to go. Pumped about that. It's a space saver in your luggage and the most popular one with caddies on tour, so I can't recommend it enough. All right, let's get back to the podcast. So you mentioned the Open Championship, which is going to be at St. Andrews. I mean, everybody's keen on that. Uh, I guess, you know, maybe share some of your thoughts about St. Andrews. And then how is St. Andrews looked upon by someone kind of who grow, grows up with it in their backyard. Yeah, um, I mean, it's going to be incredible, especially because we're a year delayed, really, with the Open being at St. Andrews. So it's um, it's just going to be so special. And Tiger's going to be there. So it's uh, that always kind of elevates it a little bit more. But, I mean, St. Andrews has always been, like, it's the home of golf worldwide for a reason. And it's the home of golf in Scotland, too. But it's just the, if, if you've never been to St. Andrews, it's just the most amazing little town. And to go and visit it at any time of the year, it's such a special little place. It's, um, they've got a gorgeous beach there. They've got really good restaurants. I mean, a lot of it is obviously based around golf, but a lot of it's not. And you have St. Andrews University, which attracts students from all over the world. So you'll find a huge amount of Americans and Canadians that are living in St. Andrews and studying there you know working in restaurants and cafes as well and it's got a real international flavor to it so i always say you know even if you don't love golf st andrews is a fantastic place to visit because it really you feel like you're in the middle of scotland in this place that's just covered in history right. um and this is this is going to be a really special one obviously this year for the open well i know we're still a couple of weeks away i mean but you're familiar with the golf course. I mean, do you have any early leans on players that you want to, you know, just talk out right now? Yeah, I am. Um, I mean, I think that Tiger is going to really dominate the chat. Yeah. And you hope so. You hope that he goes out there and has a brilliant open. I think if there was any one of the majors that, I mean, you obviously think that Tiger's always going to do well at the Masters, but the issue this year was going to be, the leg and the walking and if you could mm -hmm. physically get around St Andrews is obviously a, a lot shorter course and it's um yeah I'm excited to see how Tiger is going to be especially after resting and not playing the US Open yeah. but I, I mean I, I love it everyone that loves golf knows the routing of St Andrews they know what the holes are like you have the iconic first tee shot with the 18th green right beside you as well. It's actually a really hard spectating course, though. Oh, I was really? there for the Open. Is it so flat? Is that why? 
Well, and because it's so, because you've got so many like shared greens and like super wide fairways, sometimes it's hard to get close. So the walk, you know, it's obviously a little bit of a bumpy walk and um, it's not my favorite spectating course. Mm. So I think I, if I was going to do the open at St. Andrews again, I would, I, I, as a fan, as a spectator, find one of the stands and like park yourself there or you know you can take your bag with your sandwiches and your coffee for the day and um, mm -hmm. yeah it's I didn't find it that easy to spectate on but then at the same time I'm like well I'm a little bit spoiled because I grew up in Scotland and I've been to St Andrews so many times so I think for someone that's really going and they're going to soak in every bit of it it's going to be the best experience in the world. Yeah. Have you ever been there on a Sunday when the course is closed? Yes, yeah, and it's amazing that you'll see people just walking up and down the fairways with their dogs. The thing that's great is that there's a real respect for it because everyone in Scotland knows what St Andrews and the old course means to the rest of the world. So, yeah, everyone roams around and it's cool. You'll see people posing for pictures on the Smoking Bridge all the time because yeah. it's it's such an iconic feature worldwide um but it's i think that's a really cool part of it is and i saw someone complaining about this there was a, a thread on twitter a few weeks ago about how you know people shouldn't be allowed just to walk around golf courses and i'm like well you've got the home of golf and on a sunday everyone just roams around the course and yeah it's um it's cool it's really unique and it's a, quite a special feature of the old course absolutely i think so too well um we met i mentioned a little bit uh you know the dp uh I saw the DP World Tour made that decision here yesterday, a couple of days ago, to kind of ban the guys that are on the Live Tour from the Scottish Open, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and I read your column from, I don't know, maybe a couple of weeks ago in the Inverness Courier talking about, you know, updating people on the Live Golf situation. And you had a thing in there that I, you kind of were able to put a number on it. I didn't realize this. You said that the Saudi fund had access to around a half a trillion dollars to utilize. Now, maybe that's not all towards golf, but I just found that the, the, the money behind this thing is just mind blowing oh. to me. Yeah, I really did. Um, oh, the whole live golf thing. I think if you're working in the media, again, you had to do your research and really look into it just to be able to talk both sides of it. I always say like, it's not my job to come on and voice my opinion on it. Mm -hmm. You know, as a host, anything I've done on it, it's kind of like, you know, here's, here's the two sides of it. Sure. It might be slightly more swayed towards one direction, but mm -hmm. then you can make up your own mind. But the, um, where the money's coming from is, is the, the contentious issue right, to put it right, mildly. Right. Um, and I think obviously a lot of people are not going to feel comfortable supporting a venture that is being funded funded yeah. by the Saudi public investment fund. Yeah. And but I think that the thing that's like kind of mind blowing to me is that they they don't want to make that money back. It's right. not like a traditional biz, business model where you're like, okay, well, I'm going to invest my money and in however many years I'm going to get my money back plus X, Y, Z. It's not that for them. It's like they're pumping all of this money into it that, they're, they're never going to get back. They're never going to get back even a fraction of it. And they right. don't care. Like, right. they don't want it back. So to me, that side of it is, like, mind-blowing. Yeah. And I don't know how it, is that sustainable, like, for any other business. And, and you look at the DP World Tour, whose financial situation has been widely reported that, you know, it's tough for them year after year. Now they've got this allegiance with the PGA Tour for some events like the Scottish Open. But... You know, this is a, a golf tour that's starting up and they do not care about making any money. <laughs> right. Yeah. Did you track the first one in London? Did you? I watched the first 10 minutes. I, my wife and I were on a trip after that, but I, I, I was just interested to see it. I, I watched the, you know, the beginning mm -hmm. of it. Did you watch it at all? I did. I watched um, most of it on Thursday. And if I wasn't actively watching it, I had it like running on YouTube in the background on my computer just so I could listen. Um, I... I watched, I didn't, I don't think I watched any on, or a little bit on Friday morning. And then I watched the end on Saturday, just because I was fascinated about how much money these people were going to mm -hmm. win um, and what it was going to look like. But yeah. I have to say, when I started watching it on Thursday, I was 
pleasantly surprised by the coverage. I think it just, I mean, it's something different, right? So it's always going to feel um, a little bit fresh and dynamic. I thought it was really fast paced. And um, when I started watching it on the Thursday, I was I was kind of into it. I was watching it like with a real interest in, in what was going to happen. And I was being nosy. I think it was research too. I had to again, be knowledgeable and, and know what was going on with it. But then I was tracking their numbers as well, just to see how many people were tuning in. And I was, again, like impressed at the number of people that were watching, especially on the Thursday. The Saturday, the ending was just a little bit too like money focused for me. Right. <laughs> just, right. yeah. you know, obviously they're like popping bottles on stage and it's like, this person made this much money yeah, today. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It's a bit like, I mean, I don't know. I don't. It's just not something that you don't see the winner of the PGA Tour being handed no. their winning check yeah. on the 18th green. Yeah, they're still trying to figure out, hang their hat on something because, I mean, you hear a lot of the PGA Tour players that are, you know, very pro PGA Tour talking about mm -hmm. how there's just no history. There's, you know, it's not all about the money. And so that is a struggle for them right now. I guess, where do you come down on the world golf ranking side of things? Do you think they deserve, I mean, to get world ranking points? I don't know. And I think that a lot of it is going to hang on this because if they are not awarded world ranking points, then it, it kind of massively dilutes their product, yeah. doesn't it? And yeah. the appeal for a lot of these guys that want to go on and create a new legacy, I guess. But mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I find it hard to, to justify giving the world ranking points. And I, I go back and forth on this. But... To a 54-hole event, right? I mean, that's the main thing. Yeah, 54-hole event. It's a small field. And, you know, you especially no disrespect to anyone because everyone's there for a reason and for their own reasons. But you're looking at the, the standard of player that's mm -hmm. filling up the kind of bottom part of the field. And mm -hmm. it just doesn't really seem all that fair that yeah. <laughs> guys on the PGA Tour that are fighting to make cuts and fighting yeah. to get world ranking points and FedEx cup points. It's like a completely different playing field. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think at best, you know, a, a partial point system is the best they could hope for to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. And I joked to somebody, I said, unless they just decide to buy the world golf. Ring, <laughs> <laughs> then that would, that would, <laughs> that would solve it pretty quickly. Um, what do you make of the PGA tours response? I watched Jay Monaghan's press conference the other day and like was impressed and mm -hmm. he gets he gets slated on social media after these things and yeah. I think that he's in a little bit of a no-win situation um but I think that they're coming out fighting I think that he's we were getting that reaction from him that we want and he's really sticking up for the players and the more i've heard about the meetings that the the players have been involved with the more that he's like you know we're we're all in this we're here for you um i obviously my brother tells me a lot and he's on the player advisory mm -hmm. council or committee like the pack um and i would never tell things that he's told me in in sure. trust but russell did say that the main point they really get across is that there's this transparency now and that the policy board and the powers that be are going to be way more transparent with the players. So, I mean, you can't really, it's, um, I, I did see that Jay was getting slaughtered on Twitter for his watch and for having his watch <laughs> on. I'm like, my, we all know yeah, he's in a right. high power position. He's obviously making good, yeah. a good amount of money. Like, yeah. let's give him a break for his, his watch. I feel like he's done a, a pretty good job. I do. My one complaint would be, you know, this has been brewing for a while, and it's it's hard for the tour's response lately to look like they weren't just responding directly to what the Live Tour is doing. You know, as a longtime caddy out there, you know, we, the caddy group has made advancements. I think you're going to see a ton of changes come about of this was what Phil said his whole reason was why. And at first we were kind of calling BS on that. And it's kind of starting to show that there is some teeth to that. I, I guess um, I just wish that they were working and maybe they were. It just appears that they weren't working on this seriously behind the scenes for the last year or two and that they're like finally like oh crap we better do something 
and you yeah. would love to see the most amount of thought possible behind it. Cause I do think it will make the PJ tour stronger in the end, if they navigate it correctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do know that the, the changes to the fall season and having these kind of events for the elite, mm -hmm. they, they were in the works a long time right. ago. So okay. again, you know, and I just think like, they don't have to, they don't have to communicate everything that they're planning to do. And sure. there's probably a lot more going on behind the scenes that we don't even have a sniff at right now. And yeah, that's yeah. fine. Like yeah. we're allowed to do that. But then, you know, I saw again, it was a bit of a Twitter storm yesterday when Taylor Gooch, <laughs> did you see his yeah. tweet? Yeah, he I was did. like, you're welcome. And yeah. it's just like, are we going to have this battle now between yeah. like, is there going to be animosity between the guys that are, on live golf between the guys on the pga tour and um i just thought you know stuff like that doesn't need to happen like you don't right. need to be going on social media and kind of yeah. behaving like that yeah and, and i and i do see that happening too interestingly you know i had a chance to uh to interview heath holt who's charles schwartzel's caddy you know they won the first event and i did a winning caddy interview with heath and and we had a great chat and you know i kind of said to him afterwards and and i and i don't this is just kind of my viewpoint, but I was like, you know, as a caddy, a guy that's traveled with Heath, that's known him since I've been out there, you know, like whether I agree with the tour or not, the live tour, I was like genuinely happy for Heath, you know, yeah. as a caddy to like, like, Hey, good for you. Like, I'm glad that this came around to you. So I think like among the caddy world, that's a pretty general viewpoint. I do think there's people that are on polar sides and I'm sure it's the same with the players as well, I guess, you know, just to wrap, put a bow on that, um, you know, you've had a chance to speak with a lot of different players. You have access to players and you mentioned your brother. And so without naming any names, I mean, is there a gen any interesting feedback you've gotten from players, you know, in talking to them about this? I think um, I'm the majority of players and I'm saying majority of it might be all of them <laughs> that I've talked to have really said that, those words like history and legacy are really coming into it and, and loyalty. And I think that, I mean, you could say everyone's got a number and everyone has a right to make their own choice and everyone has a different motivation for their choice. So like, that's fine. And who are we to ever be like, well, I'm judging you for taking a hundred million when that's going to be like generational money in your family now for your kids. Yeah. And I mean, everyone's got their own reason for doing it, but then everyone also has their own reason for playing professional golf, for competing week after week and motivation to improve and get better. And I think for some, the legacy and the history and having their name on a trophy that the greats have had their name on, there's just nothing that can replace that for them. But yeah. going back, maybe I'm going to ask you a question. We're flipping okay. this a little bit, but from That's the fair. caddy point of view, because I think that the caddies are obviously being really well looked after yeah. with Liv. And I don't know if it's this for, you know, every tournament, but are they getting like their, it looked like everyone was flying on chartered planes and they were getting their accommodation and like they were in, I saw a sign, it was like, not just player dining, it was player yeah. and caddy dining. Yeah. So, you know, that has to be a little bit interesting for caddies, like where, and I'm not saying where their loyalty lies, because obviously if they're employed and they're working mm -hmm. for someone on the PGA Tour, hopefully they have a great relationship. But, you know, that has to be quite enticing for caddies to say like, hey, maybe I want, you know, to get over there and get a little piece of that action and potentially yeah. make up a lot of money. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's very alluring. I'm sure there's caddies that are, you know, knocking on live players, you know, doors to say, hey, do you need somebody? And there's going to be some changeover, you know, with as with any tour. Um, I haven't mm -hmm. heard of any caddies whose players have gone to the live tour that have said, nah, man, I'm out on that. Um, you know, and I think the caddies are probably not having to deal with the blowback that the players are. You know, I've always viewed caddying on the PGA tour, cause that's the only tour I've caddied on as being a privilege. Um, you know, and, 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 and we, you know, I didn't start in the seventies, eighties, nineties. I started in 2004 and it has even gotten better out there since then. Um, could it be even better? Yes. I think, and, and I think it will too. I think there's a lot of improvements that the PGA tour could continue to make, um, for caddies. And I think what they're doing on the live tour is, is really cool. 
in a lot of respects, you talk about the player dining, but they're kind of almost flipping the business model too. They're saying, we're going to pay for all your expenses and Mm -hmm. we're going to cut you the paycheck at the end of the week. That's not even going to come out of your player's percentage, which is again, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, so like Charles made 4.75 million for winning and then the (laughs) tournament, the team event, right? And, and he didn't have to cut into his winnings to pay Heath. Liv paid Heath for him. No so, way. You know, so that's that's pretty crazy. That's what we talked about earlier. Like the money, it just, it's so big that they don't even care if they make it back. They're just like, you know, going to pour it all over everyone. I didn't know that. And then, of course, you have the situation where the player has a great relationship with their caddy. And there's that loyalty between the two of them, that bond, that they'll probably want to give them extra money too to say yeah, like they probably got paid you know, on top of that as well yeah yeah like here yeah. you go like i know that you're getting covered by live but you know i want to say thank you and i just won 4.75 million for three days yeah. of golf like yeah. the money when we talk about the money and especially the signing bonuses it's it's very hard to equate that to real life mm-hmm. you know and we say you know i've found myself saying these numbers of like 125 million 200 million and you're like i just said that very blase like how on earth can we ever understand how much money that actually is yeah no i know you do see it in other sports though you know nfl contracts or baseball you know Mm -hmm. you're like hey 10 year 250 million dollars and and so you know you can make a case for saying that golfers have been an underpaid bunch compared to other sports uh and and so you know we'll see i mean the two are kind of up to their purses pretty darn quickly and I'm sure there will be a salary component that's rolled out here in years to come, which you can make case for being a necessity, like travel expenses, like, hey, here's $100,000 for the year. You know, you can pay for your hotels at least, you know. And so we'll see, you know, the whole story will be different next week. <laughs> we know that. I know, I know. But for the Scottish Open, they're giving them, is it seven and a half thousand dollars to, right. yeah, it's, I think each player was getting like, seven thousand five hundred dollars to put towards like their flight and their accommodation and their travel expenses so the 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 guys that i i'm really like especially with the changes to the fall events and having these events for the top 50 you know it's it's just you it's like the rich are getting richer and then you look at the guys that are maybe like 100 to 125 in the FedEx Cup standings and it's like it's hard it's you know even the guys that are out with the 125 like it is it's a grind and it's it's hard it has to be like a real worry and especially when you're seeing all this money (laughs) through live golf and then knowing that the the top 50 in the FedEx Cup standings are going to get to play in these extra events for for more money yeah they they need to not forget about you know, the roots and, and making opportunities for new players or veteran players to kind of continue to thrive. So I'm sure the tour will look at that and we've seen it play out on live too. Um, all right, we'll, we'll wrap it up here. I've got a, a few kind of rapid fire questions for you and then we'll let you get on with your day. Um, what's your favorite golf course in the world? Oh my gosh. I feel like I should say like, um, the old course or a Scottish golf course. If, uh, can I say two? Can I say one yeah. in Scotland and one? In, sure. If I'm going to say one in Scotland, I'm going to say um, North Berwick. Okay. And if you've I've never heard. been to North Berwick, it's not far from the Renaissance. And it's just an amazing part of Scotland. It's right on the coast. It's like amazing links golf. So I would say North Berwick. And then again, I'm kind of sticking with that linksy theme. And maybe it's just because it was such a special moment for me as well. But uh, Whistling Straits, when I was there for the Ryder Cup last year, I was just in awe of that place. And I was working for Team Europe and it was a real career goal of mine to work a Ryder Cup. So it was just an amazing week from start to finish. But that I've never taken more pictures of a golf course in my life. Everywhere I went, I was like, snap, snap. And it's a little bit Scottish too. There yeah. was a real Scottish influence there. Um you know, especially being right on the lake. It was just amazing. So yeah. I would say, yeah, Whistling Straits. I can't really beat that. Those are good answers. That's a special place for me too. I was where I uh, caddied my first ever PGA Aww. Tour event back in, in 2004. Cool. So I, I have I have similar feelings. All right, uh, finish this sentence. Haggis tastes like... Deliciousness. Oh. <laughs> have you ever- All right, I like have it. Have you had it 
Never had it. My I asked my wife's had it, and I asked her, and and she said it greasy meat is what she said. Really? See, you have to have good haggis, and there I've seen people have like imitation haggis in the states, and I'm like, well, you can't get the real thing yeah. because it's banned over here. Like one of the oh, really? <laughs> ingredients <laughs> you're not allowed to consume in the U.S. Um, so you have to have good haggis, and there are certain places in Scotland that that win awards year after year. So if you are going to Scotland, this is a general tip for anyone, and you want to try haggis, do your research okay. and you have to find a haggis that has won awards. Okay. And don't just go and have like the greasy, horrible stuff. Cause it shouldn't be greasy. It should be like kind of oaty and creamy almost. So that, that probably makes it sound gross. <laughs> I No, I will, if I'm ever over there, I will try it and I'll do my research. Yeah, it is great for breakfast, like to have a big Scottish breakfast, like the fry up and to have like bacon, eggs, sausage. But then we have a thing called a, a, a tatty scone, a potato scone. And if you can have a potato scone and haggis, oh my, and baked beans, that's like the dream breakfast. Great way to start your day. Um, yeah. Would you have tried to stop the runaway golf cart at the Travelers? <laughs> um, no. No. <laughs> You're smart. Uh, would you? What? Yeah, uh, no, I wouldn't have either. I did say that that guy I thought was would have made an excellent caddy because he knows when to step in and when not to. Okay. And he said, "No, I'm not touching that one." No, I'm, that was pretty I funny though. My, my, yeah. All right, you're pregnant. Congratulations. Thank you. You have a baby boy coming, maybe in like four months or so. I, I think. Uh, November, Thanksgiving week. Although um, last week the, we went for a scan and they were like, I think you're going to be a little bit earlier than you think. So um, yeah, November time anyway. Awesome. Well, I, I did look through the top 100 golfers in the world and I picked five names. And okay. I just want to hear one of these that you would take. And maybe you're considering it or maybe you're not. I did I did leave out the Asian players, some of those ones that I thought were, were, a, were a no-go. But if I gave you these okay. five names, which one... Uh, would you maybe choose uh, okay. Victor, Xander, Max, Maverick, or Burned? <laughs> well, our last name is Bayless. So Burned Bayless would be, well, that would be quite a statement, wouldn't it? I think if I had to pick any of those names, I would go with Max because, Max. yeah, lovely name, like straight to the point. Also, and here's if, as if anyone cares, but our uh, middle name is going to be Knox for the boy. Okay. So Max yeah. Knox Bayless. How many people can say they have two X's in their names? So <laughs> we're not calling him Max, though. We have decided on the name and it's not Max. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, don't, don't make <laughs> it the Max Homa, his, um, his little boy must be due around about the same time. So I wonder yeah. if we're going to get a Max Jr. from him. Max Jr. That'd be sick. Yeah. Uh, he'll probably be a great Twitter follow. Yeah. Um, all right. Last question. <laughs> Okay. You've got a one-shot lead entering the final round of the Women's British Open. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and your caddy calls you the night before and says that, you know, he or she broke their leg and can't go in the final round. But you can call anyone to caddy for you in the final round. Who do you call? Oh, no-brainer, my dad, 100%. For a couple oh. of reasons. One, because I know that it would mean the absolute world to him. <laughs> and he's a golf nut. And... Two, because he would like, if if I was in the position where I had a one shot lead heading into the final round, I would definitely need someone to like, uh, keep me talking, keep me preoccupied, calm me down a little bit. And he would be that person for sure. So definitely my dad. Nice. Well, Diane, I really appreciate you taking the time out. It's been great to catch up with you. Uh, you can follow her on Twitter at Noxy Diane and, and all the other things we mentioned that she's got going on. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, look forward to maybe seeing you in person sometime. Good luck with the rest of your pregnancy and, and, and thanks for taking some time. Can you hear my, my my little puppy has been sitting at my feet this whole time and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a recipe for disaster because he's going to make a noise. So he barks just as we're finishing to say goodbye to you. So love that it. was perfect timing. Thank you so much for having me on. I loved it. Very honored to be your first female guest. And yes, uh, yeah, I love it. We'll get together soon. Cheers. Just a reminder that this Under the Strap podcast is presented by the Therabody Theragun. We'll be back soon with another podcast, so please subscribe. And in the meantime, make sure to follow the Caddy Network on all your social media channels. I'm host John Radhouse. Thank you for listening.